Hello and welcome to the Family Histories podcast, the show for and about those of us all around the world who are sat in libraries, archives and spare rooms, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian and I've been researching my entire family history since 1995. In this episode, the captain will be finding out about one-name studies, will be heading off to sea against France and Spain, and will be trying to solve a possible illegitimacy mystery in 19th century Shropshire in England. So, put down that DNA swab, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a family historian who isn't content with researching just his family history. He also has a one-name study. But he isn't just content with researching his family history in a one-name study. Because he also has a one-place study too. So, before he begins a one-podcast study, let's actually meet today's guest, Steve Jackson. Hello, Steve. Welcome to the show. Hello. Glad to be here. Well, it's it's a pleasure. It's good good to speak to you. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see what it see what I did there? <laughs> um, I did. So yes. How, nobody can resist. <laughs> gotta to, gotta to get a pun. I know that you are in my Twitter feed anyway, you are the pun king. Yep, indeed. I am pun stoppable. Um a firm believer that the pun is mightier <laughs> than the sword. <laughs> Uh, So, as is customary, we always start right at the beginning with how you got into family history. So, would you mind explaining how you got uh, hooked on this wonderful pastime? Yeah, it's... um, I've come fairly late to it, I guess. Um, I've I've seen a lot of people who've been researching their family history for decades. Um, But I think I only made a start about 2007. Um, And the... There were two things, I suppose, that prompted it. One was my now late mother's uh, maiden name, which we've kind of mentioned a couple of times, <laughs> uh, sort of, actually, okay. um, A-T-C-H-E-R-L-E-Y. Um, I do remember every now and then kind of saying to, do you know, with a surname like that, it would be a doddle to trace your family tree. But it was okay. it was kind of a throwaway remark, really. Um, nothing ever came of it, but I, I did start watching, um, who do you think you are, uh, TV series when it was on okay. and, yep. um, found the research they were doing more and more fascinating. And, um, I believe it was actually Graham Norton's episode, um, with the story of this, um, true green Irishman, as it were, having roots in Yorkshire, if I remember, and being, uh, having the, the ancestors being transplanted. And it was like, what? Wow. And that was what made me decide, you know, I think I really ought to make good on those comments that I've made to mum every now and then over the years. Um, what did I go on to at that point? Jeans Reunited, I think it was. Um, got the lowest subscription possible, went on and looked for uh, the surname Ashley around uh, Newport in Shropshire, which is where our new mum had come from, and found a family. Okay, yeah. Um, too early to catch my granddad, Fred, but there was Samuel and his wife. And I rang mum up and said, Mum, what was your grandfather's name? And... Um, Yes, just showing the kind of value of always talking to the living relatives first. She said, oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, he died <laughs> long before I was born. Um, but then she did think about it. And finally, the old saying did come true when she said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. It was Samuel. And I'd got Samuel actually there on the 1901 census, the most recently available one at that time, on my screen. So it was I'm in, started tracing from there. So it concentrated on mum's line for quite some time. My own surname being Jackson uh, didn't have quite the same appeal in terms of, yeah, it's going to be easy tracking down Jacksons because there aren't many of them either. (laughs) There's quite a few Jacksons in my experience, yeah. Oh, yes, there are. (laughs) Yes, yes, quite a few. So actually kind of won over. Um. And what I found from the Ashleys, I mean, obviously there's the fascination of 
tracing the generations further back uh, until we get to the brick wall that we will talk about later and mm -hmm. who the other family members were. It was eventually then spreading that research out. There's other Ashleys out there, not that many of them, which isn't surprising. Who are they? How are they connected? And I started gathering the all the Ashley records that I could started trying to connect them, uh, mainly in the census era, which made it easier, and eventually kind of found, you know, these. it isn't just interesting to find these people and all their connections, what stories these people have to tell. And so many of those stories are kind of, they're out there in little snippets and fragments yeah. and chunks here, there and everywhere, different records, newspapers and so on. And it became a mission to kind of pull those different threads together and weave them into a, a the kind of the broader tapestry that, that showed uh, the stories that they had and that have kind of been lost and frog, fra fragmented. There must be a pun in there somewhere. Uh, fragmented um, <laughs> over time. And yeah, as you can imagine, I was well and truly hooked. You mentioned being able to to ask your late mother uh, for some information. Were there many other uh, relatives around that you were able to, to ask? Not from an actually perspective, no, because mum was an only child. Um, okay. Her mother died before I was born. And although okay. I do have the vaguest of memories of meeting Grandad Fred, um, he died, I think, about 1970. So... Um, okay. There was no kind of more immediate family to um, to go to. One thing I did find, though, uh, or one person I did find quite early on by going online and searching for things was um, I spotted somebody else that was also researching Achilles. And she was in Canada and she was the granddaughter of an Achille. Um, so descended from Ashley's living in Canada, the definition of a distant relative. Yes, definitely. Um, and I found that she'd already been working on the Ashley's for about 20 years at that point. Oh, okay, head start. Yeah, head start, but not with a great deal of help from the internet at that point, uh, although it was kind of, you know, in, in the, the early stages of being a really good source. So Barbara sent me, uh, she was very good, sent me her tree, or Jedcom, and I had a, a good look at what was on there and decided early on, I'm not just going to say, okay, that's great, I've got this, I don't need to do any more, uh, or even, okay, I'm going to take this and add to it necessarily, but take this and use it as a series of prompts, okay. a bit of a guide perhaps when I get stuck, but not something I would attempt to kind of rebuild the actually tree through my own resource, but with that really helpful resource there uh, as backup to to sort of point me in directions when I wasn't too sure where I was going and occasionally to to kind of oh actually no actually no um I don't think that's quite right let's um look at these records and reevaluate them and um and add to what Barbara had started so it's been a really really helpful collaboration over the years as we've um, sent information zipping backwards and forwards across the internet uh, and email, um, exchanging thoughts and theories and uh, records that we found. You said you started with Genes Reunited. Did you progress to kind of any real archives at all or have you kind of progressed onto different online platforms for your research? I don't think it was very long before I pushed on from Genes Reunited. I'm trying to think what came first. More than likely it was Ancestry. And then um, Find My Past began to show signs of being uh, a, a worthy, I was going to use the word competitor, but they're kind of, to me, obviously they are complementary, complementary yeah. um, sources. They they have their own, they're, each has their own transcription. So errors that are on one site, you might be able to, overcome them on the other yeah. and different records um so as the years went on find my past added shropshire parish registers uh, and staffordshire too and that has been kind of shropshire in particular the heartland of the actually is actually central as i kind of call it so that was really really helpful okay ancestry even at that point kind of 
had records from other parts of the country and worldwide, which um, helped me trace the Atchleys, that the, the many of them that kind of moved away from Shropshire um, over the decades. Um, that movement, incidentally, to the extent that I don't think there's actually anybody left in Shropshire now with the Atchley surname. Um, the last two both acquired it by marriage and died... I think both died within the last 10 years. So from, uh, I, I once saw uh, actually being referred to uh, as a good old Shropshire name, but it's a Shropshire name no more. Definitely consigned to history, I guess. If you looked, if you wanted to kind of guess where the Ashleys came from by looking at where they are now, you wouldn't really get much of a clue. Um, and even, you know, the I think people sometimes look at the... Uh, a, there's an online source that uses telephone directory records. And yeah, there's some actually is there in Shropshire, but it really doesn't give you that kind of uh, picture of the importance of Shropshire as, as the base uh, from, from which the actually came. One of the thrills, incidentally, um, partway into the, the research journey was... Um, finding the place that I'm fairly sure that the the actualists took their name from um okay not a, not even a, not a village not a hamlet just a, a farmstead really I think which has existed since probably at least around 1200s okay. there there are still buildings there now and nearby there's a farm called Hley farm so the the spellings of the surname that came from the place um, people who were actually th those spellings have diverged once after the the connection of people and place was lost um, when they moved to other parts of Shropshire. So it was um, when I finally got that and realised, wow. But actually, to actually is not much of a diversion. No, no, and that I suppose isn't. There's another kind of um, quirk of doing a research, doing your research on a. A fairly rare name, and let's face it, there are a huge number of surnames, and um, a lot of which are relatively uncommon. But one of the problems you get with that, in my head, it was great. I find actually in the database, they're almost certainly going to be related somehow, and certainly with the one name study that it, it turned into, they're in my field of interest. But the other side of the coin, with a rare... Uh, ish and unusual surname uh, just to kind of put it in context there's generally only been a hundred or so at living actually at any given time certainly from the 1800s onwards um, that's how uncommon it is but yeah that other side of the coin is that when people are transcribing it and it's not perfectly written they've never heard of it okay and what on earth is that <laughs> oh, I think it's whatever. So you do get quite a lot of very mangled transcriptions of the surname as well. I bet. Which I've kind of learnt to get around, <laughs> even to the point of scribbling the name actually myself and then looking at it and think, what else could you read that as? Oh, I'll have a look for that. <laughs> and sure enough, if you imagine a, a, a pointy A uh, with a T that perhaps hasn't been crossed that well, it looks okay. a little bit like an M, and then you get the C. Okay. And sure enough, I have found transcriptions of Ashley as McHurley, <laughs> which is not what you would think of looking for. No, that would not be on my suspect list. Um, when you start researching Ashleys, yes, let's look for the, uh, the Scottish <laughs> branch of the family, the McHurleys. <laughs> but they're out there, and occasionally pronunciation means that there's the odd one or two. Hatchley's out there, don't you know? Um, <laughs> and oh, yes, a weird and wonderful selection of others. Do you think this makes you really good at crosswords and word searches? <laughs> well, certainly, I do utter crosswords from time to time when I'm trying to find people <laughs> that I can't find. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did used to do crosswords, but genealogy hasn't left a lot of time for that. Uh. I think uh, in terms of um, things that I could compare genealogy to, it's quite often Sudoku. 
uh, which okay. Dad used to be quite keen on, where you have to get everything has got to add up across, mm -hmm. you know, whichever way you follow the line, it's got to add up to the same thing. And I kind of look at genealogy like that. You get these different sources of information and it, it somehow it's all got to make the same sense, whichever way you put it together. With all of the time that you are spending on your one name study, does this mean that maybe the rest of your family history has to compete? And also, how on earth do you find time to then also do a one-place study? It helps enormously now that I was able to take early retirement a couple of summers ago. But yeah, even, um, even before retirement, I was kind of pursuing this with a, I'm going to call it single-minded dedication. <laughs> Not obsession at all. No, no, not not obsessive. Okay. Um, definitely just a kind of, yes, single-minded dedication to the cause of finding this information out. The Achilles did kind of, certainly in the early days in particular, push the rest, uh, even of mum's other family lines. Um, <laughs> her mother's maiden name was Hall, ah. for example, H-A-L-L. Um, um, yes, actually, Hall. Hmm. I'm going to stick to the Ashleys for a bit, I think. Um, <laughs> particularly when I found out that she then had a different branch of halls coming in on her maternal line a bit further back. It's like, how can you do this to me? Um, but yes, I did um, in lulls between um, tracking down the Ashleys and trying to kind of piece everything together. Um, yeah, let's go and see where else... I come from, as it were, where my ancestors come from. And um, mum was pretty much 100% Staffordshire and Shropshire. And eventually, okay, I've got to do it. I've got to look at Jackson. I've got to start with dad. Very similar experience. Dad, what was um, what were your grandparents' names? Well, I don't know. We knew them as Granny Jackson and Granny Lawrence, <laughs> which... We weren't told their names. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Thanks, Dad. That's really helpful. <laughs> um, but managed to um, track them down myself um, with certificates and, and, and whatnot and got into them. Uh, Jackson, sadly, I've gone back to the early 1800s in Staffordshire and ground to a halt there. Um, William Jackson, not that rare a name. He appeared on the 1841 census uh, at Abbots Bromley and had the temerity to die before 1851 when I would have got a better idea of his age and where he was actually Jacksonly born. Oh. Um, how dare he? And of course, there are two different William Jacksons from Abbots Bromley around 1800 and so far I haven't really cracked the case but yeah there, there was a bit more variety on dad's side um Staffordshire with Abbots Bromley um but also Warwickshire um where I think he was quite shocked when I revealed a policeman ancestor also Oxfordshire but the biggest shock for me I think on dad's line was eventually finding that I had ancestors in Northamptonshire uh which is where I've lived <laughs> since the early 1970s. Not where I was born at all, but it was like, oh, I've got cherries in my tree. <laughs> <laughs> and those cherries lived in a little village that's about four miles away from where I live now. Okay. And so there was this ancestral journey from a village four miles away from me, down into Oxfordshire, up into Warwickshire, and eventually... The little branch that came over to where I am now over a course of about 200 years. That little story did uh, did tickle me rather. It's almost like you've done a, a homecoming. Mm. Yes, it's uh, an ancestral journey that um, I was quite surprised to find myself at, at, at one end of. It's that time in the show that I call Relatively Speaking, where I've challenged my guest to choose one of their most fascinatingly good, bad or just plain ugly relatives, and then to tell us their life story. So, Steve, 
Who are you going to tell us about? I'm going to tell you about Captain James Atchley of the Royal Marines, um, who was my second cousin seven times removed. Oh, OK. <laughs> so we are going back a little bit there, a few generations. But, you know, when you've got somebody who was at Trafalgar, wow. that makes for an interesting um, story. Hmm. Good or bad or ugly? I think when we look at people, we tend to find varying quantities of both sides of the coin. Yeah. And I think you'll find that that was certainly the case with Captain James. His father was the Reverend James, actually, so he had the, the same name. He was an actually of note okay. uh, as he became a master at Shrewsbury School, where he'd been a pupil, the, uh, the grammar school at Shrewsbury, and ended up rising to the position of headmaster and was also made a burgess of Shrewsbury, which all sounds great until you find the stories about the school's fortunes falling to their lowest oh dear. towards the end of the 18th century when James was in charge. Oh, okay. mm. The number of pupils attending the school fell to 22. James was said to be intemperate in his habits. It was written that the favourite amusement of this headmaster and his colleagues was to practice kicking at a flitch of bacon hung in the kitchen for the purpose to see who could kick the highest. That doesn't sound like a school. Uh-huh. <laughs> no. The school register... And other school records went missing while James was at the helm. <laughs> Books from the library were allegedly given away to pupils by James, while other volumes were mutilated as a result oh. of pupils given, being given free run of the place. OK. Uh, James, you're letting the family name down. This is not sounding good. <laughs> now, I've got to add to all that that this bad press... Uh, that was given to the Reverend James actually came quite a few years after his death, so he couldn't answer anything back. Some okay. of it is based on second-hand reports, and some of the allegations are made in terms that make it clear that they weren't necessarily substantiated. Okay. And when you look at the school records, those mm. those that survived James Head's mas headmastership, it mm. had been in decline for several decades before he took over. And that is praise for James yeah. as headmaster to be found if you look hard enough. Now, Barbara Lang, who I mentioned earlier, my fellow <laughs> actually researcher over in Canada, she's told me that according to the Shrewsbury School archivist, uh, and I quote, much of what has been reported about him is hearsay and in some cases incorrect. And... There was also an intriguing suggestion from that archivist. In Barbara's words, he believed James to have been incapacitated, possibly by a stroke. So, mm, so James's physical or mental condition, okay. or if the stories are to be believed, his intemperance may have led to some other oddities. Okay. For example, although he was a clergyman. It doesn't appear that his son James, uh, yes, I am going to get to talk about James Jr., was christened or baptised. That's unusual. And the same applies to James Jr.'s two younger sisters. So we've got the Reverend James actually baptised. All the first um, children uh, were baptised. And I don't know if this is telling, but I think James Jr. was born in or about the year uh, in or about because i don't know i've got no definite kind of i've got no baptism record to pin anything to um 1775 ish uh that was the year on which his the sister born just before him died and i do wonder if that death had a fairly far-reaching impact uh, on the yeah. Reverend James and, and kind of influenced and affected what he did thereafter. No proof or, or kind of evidence either way. Anyway, the younger James, the one I said I was <laughs> going to talk about, having given this kind of uh, picture of the, um, the the family that he came from. Um, born around 1775, it appears, um, in Shrewsbury, almost certainly. In 1792, he was apprenticed to an attorney and solicitor in Shrewsbury, 
So all the signs were he was heading for a very different life to the one that he ended up yeah, living. Exactly. Uh, Practising law was clearly something that James was not suited to for whatever reason. Maybe he didn't like it. Maybe he wasn't actually capable of it. Who knows? He didn't complete his five-year apprenticeship. Uh, he joined the Royal Marines instead uh, and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1794. So this is about two years after he started that five-year apprenticeship. <laughs> Slight change of plans there. Um, he rose to the rank of first lieutenant in 1795, in which year he was aboard the Thetis uh, when it was one of two ships which attacked five French frigates. Try saying that in a hurry. Five French yeah. frigates Careful in there. Chesapeake Bay, capturing two of them. So, yes, the um, our... Um, kind of occasional disagreements with France were very much to the fore at that yeah. time. And he was there in the thick of it over at Chesapeake Bay, helping with the capture of some uh, French frigates. He became a captain of Marines in 1803 and joined uh, the Conqueror on the 6th of April, 1805. And it was on that ship that he took part in the Battle of Trafalgar on the 21st of October that year. Quite appropriate that we're recording this now in the month of the anniversary. Yeah. Trafalgar, of course, remembered as a stunning naval victory, headed, of course, by Admiral Nelson, who sadly perished from the wounds he received during the battle. Nelson had his fleet divide into two lines, which cut across the single line of the enemy, a combined French and Spanish fleet. Uh, the British ships caused carnage and won the day while suffering comparatively little in the way of damage or casualties itself. For those participating, especially on the Franco-Spanish side, an overall view of the battle quickly became impossible as smoke enveloped the scene. And meanwhile, all around you could hear the shots of muskets, the roar of cannons, the splintering and crashing of ship's timbers, and I would imagine a heck of a lot of shouting. Maybe a bit of cheering wow. as well from time to time. But I, I'd love to be able to record something like that with the sound <laughs> effects going on in the background. <laughs> you can kind of imagine that being done on the, who do you think you are? Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, the French Admiral Villeneuve uh, was aboard the flagship Bucentaur. Uh, the Conqueror, on which James actually served, inflicted heavy damage on this vessel in two passes. I'm going to quote a few snippets um, with a little paraphrasing here and there from uh, a number of different sources okay. that I've found over the years in researching uh, the battle and James's part in it. Okay. So the, the Conqueror was fifth in Nelson's line at the start of the battle and was the fourth ship to attack the Bucentaur but the first to bring effective fire against her. The whole of the Conqueror's larboard broadside, more than 30 guns, smashed through the Bussenteur's stern. The Conqueror's fire tore into the French ship, wreaking havoc, dismembering sailors, wow. knocking over guns and splintering the mizzen and mainmasts, which collapsed over the starboard side. Wreckage and torn canvas covered many of the gun ports. Pellew luffed the Conqueror and came to for another broadside, while Villeneuve prepared to flee and raise his flag on another ship, only to find that his escape vessel had vanished. Oh. The Bucentaur couldn't even strike its colours because they'd gone over with the foremast. Oh. So in order to attempt to surrender, a midshipman had to stand on the upper deck and wave a white flag. Okay. <laughs> Slight problem there. Yeah. It was kind of, I can't get away from here because my escape boat's disappeared in the carnage. We can't fight back because the, the masts and the sails are over the gun ports. <laughs> it was absolutely desperate uh, on the French flagship, uh, and particularly when they realised they hadn't even got... Uh, the flag so that they could um, strike their colours with. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, it's written, Pellew was not content with his great prize, however, and was anxious to take on the Santissima Trinidad. He sent the commander of Marines, Captain James Atchley, 
and three of his men and a couple of sailors over to take command of the stricken Bucentaur. Actually found the dead thrown back as they fell among the middle of the deck in heaps. Shot passing through these had fearfully mangled the bodies. More than 400 had been killed and wounded, of whom an extraordinary proportion had lost their heads. A raking shot which entered on the lower deck had glanced along the beams and through the thickest of the people, and a French officer declared that this shot alone had killed and disabled nearly 40 men. So, wow. yeah, we kind of, yeah, it was a glorious battle and we won. The reality of what happened to some of the people involved in that is really quite something yeah. when you look at the, uh, the the personal accounts of what they found. Now, when James reached the quarter deck, three French officers slowly walked towards him. To who, said Villeneuve in English, which is just as well for me because my French accent's not that great, proffering his sword, <laughs> have I the honour of surrendering? To Captain Pellew of the Conqueror, replied Atchley. It is a satisfaction to me, Villeneuve said courteously, that it is to one so fortunate as Sir Edward Pellew that I have lowered my flag. Ashley was taken aback. It is his brother, sir. His brother? What? Are there two of them? <laughs> so, uh, yes. There were, <laughs> there were actually two quite prominent Pellew brothers uh, in the Royal Navy, and uh, Villeneuve thought he'd surrendered to the wrong one. So, actually locked the magazines, put the keys in his pocket and escorted Villeneuve and two of his officers to a waiting cutter. Seeing that Pelly had gone with the Conqueror, which is where he wanted to take them so that they could surrender their swords uh, to him as the captain of the ship that was responsible for putting him in that position, um, he looked around for the nearest... British ship as an alternative, and that was the Mars. And as a result of that, the swords actually ended up in the possession of Admiral Collingwood, who kept them, although they rightfully belonged to Pellew. <laughs> now, I was actually quite thrilled not that long ago, because I, I really, I, I wanted to be able to see this sword that actually had taken, they, they kind of offered them to him, you know, accept my sword. No, it's not right for me to, to, take your sword it's got to be the captain of the ship um no i really wanted to see that sword but wasn't too clear on where it was um and i not that long ago found that it's on display at the nelson museum and local history center in monmouth um okay. Sadly, although lockdown is kind of over, that is currently still closed, but they are yeah. hoping to open or uh, reopen in due course. Uh, whenever that turns out to be, obviously I'm going to pay a visit and uh, have I'll a look at the, door. at the sword that Captain James, yeah, possibly, uh, you know, <laughs> possibly with cannons roaring. And <laughs> <laughs> Let me in in the name of Captain James, actually. <laughs> um, yes, I, I I do want to see that, that kind of, that is the ultimate actually souvenir. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get that from eBay somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened to James after, after that? Well, um, in the notes I've prepared for this, I've, I've said, so James actually, a hero, right? Um not to his wife, he wasn't. Oh. Yes, he was married um, before Trafalgar, uh, two or three years before Trafalgar, to Christiana, uh, a daughter of Thomas Sharp, Sharp with an I in it, uh, pronouncing it Sharp correctly or incorrectly, a secretary of the Royal Bank of Scotland who died when Christiana was about 16. Uh, and Christiana bore James two children, a girl and a boy, most likely at East Stonehouse in Devon, close to where James had been based. Uh, Emma Eustacia Ashley was born around 1804, sadly died at the age of 15, 
uh, while William Sher Langton, actually born around 1809, went on to join the Royal Marines himself and following his father's footsteps, as it were. Okay. But it can't have been long after William's birth that Captain James actually abandoned his family and settled into what became a long-term relationship with a woman named Sarah Perkins, with whom he had six children from 1811 to 1824 in Surrey. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a bit of a turn up <laughs> for the books. Uh, Christiana, as we can imagine, was distraught and left with little in the way of financial support. Just as James had initially embarked on a career he did not suit, so he'd also committed to a marriage which he must have thought a mistake. His own thoughts on the matter are not known, but thanks to a series of letters written by Christiana, I've got um, scans of photocopies of some of them and... Fairly recently, I've actually managed to acquire some of the originals, uh, The Power of eBay, yet again. We do have something of her side of the story. She found that James, quote, was very much in debt, but as he belonged to the Plymouth Division and the place where they were staying, being a cheap part of the country, I was in great hopes that by good management, we might get on as well as our neighbours. But to my sorrow... I too late found that it was impossible. His habits were so expensive, fond of cards, dogs and horses, which never can answer upon an officer's pay. So, mm, yeah, Captain James looking uh, like, in some ways, perhaps taking after his uh, father in in his father's later life. Um, On the 8th of September, 1810, At the suit of three men to whom he owed money, James was committed to the King's Bench, a debtor's prison in Southwark. Ah. Christiana, in one of her letters, said that she helped to secure her husband's release by procuring his retirement on full pay, which enabled him to kind of set out uh, his financial assets and how he would pay off his debtors, uh, would pay off the men he owed money to, uh, and so was given his release. But there's no evidence of James showing any kind of gratitude for this, unfortunately. Um, In contrast to his relationship with poor Christiana, there's every sign that with the mother of his six Surrey-born children, James actually found happiness and true love. In his will, he wrote, All my property of every sort and description that I may be possessed of or in any way entitled unto... I give and bequeath to my dear and constant friend and companion, Sarah Perkins. Love, actually. His wife, Christiana, however, had the last, albeit somewhat hollow, laugh. Yes, actually she did. James actually died in 1834, and as his lawful widow, she received a pension until her death at East Stone House. Sadly, just four years later in 1838. So he kind of came good in the end, but (laughs) only by virtue of the fact he had no control over where his uh, naval pension went to. Now, I'm going to add a brief postscript, very brief. James and Sarah's granddaughter, Emily Dennis, married police officer John Thomas Preston. Uh, And through them, there are actually living descendants uh, of Captain James, actually. Um, there are no actuallys descended from him, actually, but there are others who don't bear the name. Now, when John Thomas Preston retired from the police force, he moved with his family to Nelson Road in Harrow, Middlesex, and ran a beer house named after the famous naval captain. The <laughs> 1911 census shows that his wife, Emily, and their son, Frank, actually... Uh, sorry, actually, they called him... They named him Frank Atchley Preston, A-T-C-H-L-E-Y. They missed the er out in the middle. Not quite hitting the mark there with homage to your ancestor, Emily. Uh, So Emily and son Frank Atchley Preston were assisting in the business. So the historical record shows that while James Atchley served under Lord Nelson, his granddaughter Emily and great-grandson Frank served in the Lord Nelson. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> twist. Yeah. Bit of good, bit of bad, perhaps a bit of ugly, 
Um, but yeah, who is there in history that can claim to be a, a total villain uh, or an absolute angel? Um, we're all capable of, um, you know, yeah. morally questionable things as well as uh, good behaviour and. When you look closely, there are there are quite often examples yeah. of both. Well, thank you, Steve, for sharing Captain James Atchley's story. It's been fascinating. Um, but I think it's now time for you to face the brick wall. Well, listeners, it's time for you to pick up those pencils because it's time to find out about my guest's research brick wall. We all run into these at some point in our research, so let's see if one of you can help my guest with his. So, Steve, how can we help? Okay, my brick wall is the very first one that I came across um, that I mentioned earlier on. Back in the early days of my research into mum's ancestry, the the unknown father of my great-great-grandfather, Henry Atchley, um, which is where things kind of run aground for a little bit. Okay. I don't know, to be honest, whether people will be able to help with this, but it, it's um, it. it's an agonising story that I have to get off my chest, and who knows, maybe somebody will suggest something, and it'll be, oh, that's <laughs> worth a shot. Well, deep breath, and uh, let it out, let it out. Okay, here we go. The tale of woe. Woe, woe, and thrice woe. (laughs) Um, His marriage register entry in 1847 uh, names his father as John Ashley, a farmer. But his baptism record in 1822 at Hinstock in Shropshire, this is the earliest record, obviously, that we have of him, okay. only names his mother, Mary Ashley. Now, for some time, I only had the family search mm-hmm. record of the baptism to go on. And, you know, you just get yep. the names, the place and the date. But eventually, I got to see the real thing. Okay. And that stated that Henry was the illegitimate son of Mary Ashley of high... Well... It's pronounced High Arkle, yep. um, but it's spelt High Urkel, E R C A W L. Um, and then it complicated matters by giving her occupation as widow. What? Because I already knew about Mary, actually. She was a daughter of Farmer Samuel, actually, of Moortown in High Arkle Parish. And she was not married, let Ah, alone a married woman who'd been widowed when Henry was baptised in 1822. Um, Now, she later married a local butcher, John Titley, and lived with him in the neighbouring parish of Waters Upton. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yes, indeed, there there is that connection there. That's how my one place study um, of Waters Upton kind of began from me going there to take photographs, uh, a photograph initially of Mary's gravestone. Some online family trees have claimed um, John Titley as Henry, actually his father. Okay. I've not seen a shred of evidence that would support <laughs> such a claim. It was, uh, it was quite, well, it wasn't ages afterwards, but it was several years after Henry's birth. I think it was late 1820s before Mary actually married John Titley. So I think it's just kind of, oh, well, he married Mary, so he's going to have been Henry's father without really looking into it in a great deal of depth. Now, there is a possibility, um, maybe, because widow, if it was Mary, widow is clearly incorrect. But what if widow was correct and the name wasn't? Um Samuel, actually, Mary's father, he had a brother named John. Uh, He sadly ended up as a farm labourer rather than a farmer, as Samuel was the older of the two, and it was he that took on the family farm. Um, Now, John actually married Elizabeth Meadows and had six children with her, but then died in 1819. And... There's a couple of possibilities here. It might be that Elizabeth 
uh, as kind of uh, related into the the Atchley family, um, adopted Henry and raised him with her own children as her own child, and telling him that her late husband John actually was his father. Perhaps he genuinely believed that John actually sure. was his father. Um, although calling him a farmer was kind of giving him a bit of a promotion. Um, but the other possibility that I can't quite rule out is that maybe Elizabeth, in her widowhood, was actually, actually Henry's mother. Can't rule that out. I, My money is on Mary as as the person named I but why she was called a widow I don't know. Do you think maybe Mary is named as a widow because she's trying to hide the illegitimacy? I do wonder if that was the case because she was of um high arkel um and the baptism was in Hinstock which while not you know not ever so far away it was it was perhaps, what, a couple of parishes or so away from where she lived. And so a baptism there um, would almost certainly not have been witnessed by people from her home parish. And it's possible there that she had the scope to be able to just embroider things slightly and say, where's where's the father? Oh, no, I'm, yeah. I'm a widow. But even so, I don't, being a farming family and in stock not being incredibly far away, I, you would think perhaps that people there would know of the Atchleys and know the family she came from. But yeah, I think that is another distinct possibility. And it's one of the reasons why I'm kind of siding more on... Mary having been named correctly and this this thing about a widow yeah. for whatever reason, whether misinformation from her or uh, a, a clerical error, literally, um, or in both senses of the phrase, inserting it uh, at the end of the record. So those are the kind of, that's the paper record side of things. And if anybody can come up with, with anything else that could yeah. add yeah. to that... Um, I have incidentally looked to see, or looked online anyway, the Shropshire archives have very, very well uh, catalogued records and I've not seen any evidence that there's going to be a, a, a bastardy um, case uh, involving Mary, probably because she was from a farming family and perhaps because, and, and maybe there was a little bit of a financial consideration involved, perhaps because Henry was passed on to his close relative, the widowed Elizabeth, who brought him up with her other kids. The obvious thing would be a Y DNA test of a direct male line descendant of Henry, which I'm not, of course, because I'm the son of the late Betty, actually, and there the Y DNA, the y -DNA trail uh, ends. Um, but if I had a Y DNA test from a direct male line descendant of Henry, uh, which I could uh, have management of, um that would be fantastic it would be really interesting to see what names match with that but so far um that hasn't happened so well my fingers are crossed uh for something to turn up soon but in the meantime uh, what's the best way for listeners to contact you if they think that they have a clue best way i mean if anybody follows me on twitter at uh Actually, ONS for One Name Study, uh, do drop me a DM there. Or if they visit my website at www.actually.org.uk, there's contact details um, through there. And my email address is steve at actually.org.uk. And that spelling again of that name uh, is A T C H. E-R-L-E-Y. Okay, well, uh, we'll have links to those channels on the show notes for this episode, and listeners will be able to go to familyhistoriespodcast.com to see those. Uh, but of course, you can also use the contact form on our website, and we'll pass the message on to Steve. Now, Steve, imagine you've got, I don't know, like a access to a time machine. Um, can you think of like a date and a place where you might want to go to be able to help solve this brick wall? 
Well, I think I'd have to kind of go back um, to 1822 okay. and drop in uh, to a certain baptism <laughs> ceremony <laughs> at Hinstock, um, heavily disguised. You know, I don't want to interrupt the timeline uh, and skew everything. Um, and kind of, yeah, does she look like a Mary? <laughs> Uh, or maybe I do some s subtle. <laughs> I don't know, maybe she's an Elizabeth. I mean, to be honest, there, there would have been quite an age difference between them. So, she be to tell. all joking aside, <laughs> and notwithstanding the fact that you know, time machine. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yes, I think there would be a fair old clue by just looking at the age of the uh, of the person who was there having their their son baptized, as to whether it was uh, young Mary. Or um, not quite so young, Elizabeth. Well, as a bit of a thank you for being on the show today, I think I've got something that might be of help. Right. But you're going to need to come through to the oh. garage. All right. OK. After you. No, no. After you. There. What do you think? Well, I don't think that's ever going to be roadworthy. Uh, it's not a car. This is my time machine. A time machine? Really? Is it meant to work? Yes, and it does. Take a seat and I'll demonstrate it. So, remind me when that brick wall is. It's the 12th of August, 1822 at Hinstock. Uh, Shropshire, England. Uh, very pretty county. OK, that's all set. Uh, you'll need this. Just press that big button when you're ready to come home. Does it beam me up or the, the whole garage move? <laughs> You've been watching too much sci-fi. You'll be the only one moving. The garage and I stay right here. So, is it going to blast me into atoms, or what? That's a very good question. I've absolutely no idea. So, Steve Jackson, thank you, goodbye, and good luck. Ooh, spot on. Although, right in the baptismal font. But I guess you can't get better than a front row seat. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin. My guest was the brilliant Steve Jackson. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please click subscribe to get the next one or consider leaving a review. Thank you very much. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.